beautiful sister Jane Wednesday night it's not quite 50 verses or whatever it was and so I thank you for being willing to uh, uh, tarry with me on Wednesday night as we went through those words but there is a whole chapter Genesis 15 yes brother Kevin I'm just really excited to share this prayer uh, you know there was a fire remember yes with Mark and Betsy I know. <laughs> you guys prayed on Wednesday and he said a thunderstorm came over just out of the blue Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, God hears our prayers. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And I just wanted to share that with you. Hallelujah. Amen. And then now he's got a viewing of his house on Monday. Thank you, Lord. Because you know, if the whole thing burns down, you can never sell his house. Right? He wants to buy there. Because the whole place burns. Sure, sure. And I got a viewing too on Monday. So Thank you, Lord. Oh, that's a blessing. Mark and Betsy, Brother yeah. Kevin, had mentioned to me something. Yeah, there was supposed to be no rain coming in. <laughs> the was just out of control. How many thankful? He rides on the yeah. on the waters. He rides on the floods. Yeah. My sister said, Cindy said that this morning. Too. He rides on the waters. He rides on the floods. Ain't no power her. Can't stop thou wings of love. She was saying that. And uh, how we're thankful he can make rain when there's right. no rain. Exactly. Said, that blesses my heart. Yeah. Mark and Betsy, uh, Brother Kevin, I don't, he might have been good before them, but I know that he met up with them some weeks ago, months ago now, I guess, uh, in a conference that was in Vegas, if I remember right, where I'm preaching the gospel. And uh, they actually have intent on moving here. And uh, they live in New Mexico. And his house was, Brother Kevin shared this past Wednesday, his house was in danger of this big forest fire. And uh, thanks be to the Lord, uh, his house is spared, Hallelujah. and he has a viewing coming up too. So you, we pray for that too, that he'd be able to do what he needs to do to, to uh, get out this way too. Amen. Hey, that's a good word. Thank you, Lord. How many thankful he does hear and he does answer. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter 15 is why I have it up on the screen as well. We're going to begin in verse 1 and read through the verses and then we'll come back through them. But Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 says... After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, or Abraham as we've come to call him, and as he would come to be called by God. And the voice of the Lord said, Do not fear, Abram, for I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. 
Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. One of the greatest verses in all scripture. Verse 6. Verse 7 says, And he said to him, that is God said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Cammonite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Raphaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. Genesis chapter 15, that's all 21 verses and we'll go back to it here in a moment. Uh, Sister Joan was asking this morning if it was my last day of teaching at school. Because again, as most of you know, I teach at math in middle school, math, seventh grade. Prayers are always much appreciated. But we were headed up, we had the last week with kids this week. The last day with kids was this past Friday. Now, teachers go in on Monday, but it'll be so quiet. <laughs> peace, peace, wonderful <laughs> peace. <laughs> How we know that old hymn, right? Coming down from the Father above. I will tell you, when it was that uh, this past week, I'd come home every day and I'd tell my wife the kids were getting more rambunctious and Sometimes when it comes holiday or when it's coming to the end of the school year where there's, there's some of the students don't make it to school. That's true because they know the testing's over and what have you. And so they don't make the school. And my love has said over the years, she'll say, maybe half of them won't come. I said, well, that's probably true, but it'll be the wrong half. It'll be, wrong half. It'll be the, the, the half that are, are uh, contentious, you know, or the ones that their parents say, you're going to school. Right? They send them on out and they come on into school and I tell you, they were just building up, even though the days, we had shorter days, early dismissal days on Thursday and Friday, but the kids were getting more and more rambunctious. But as I was telling Sister Joan this morning, even though they got more rambunctious and it was harder to deal with, yet, thanks be to the Lord, on Friday the bell rang and the bus came. Glory, glory, glory. <laughs> so if you heard a shout of glory, it was, it was me out in Alba uh, this past Friday. But in a sense, now, this might be slightly too strong of a description to use, but it's uh, sometimes not too strong a description to use. But I went from horror to hope <laughs> when the bell rang and the bus came, the kids are leaving, and we all smile as the buses are leaving, and we wave at them, and then they leave, and then the teachers go back in, and we're like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, from horror uh, to hope. How many know in life a lot of things are that way, right? In this fallen world in which we live, there's a lot of things that are from horror to hope. And I like words that start with the same letters, so that's the title of the message this morning, From Horror to Hope in the Life of Abraham. Notice back at verse 1 of this 15th chapter, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. After these things, what does that mean? Well, of course, you, it says after these things, if you want to know what these things were, that the after is coming, you've got to read the chapters before, right? You've got to read the chapters before to see what was happening. Now, in the grand scheme of things, we're only 15 chapters into Scripture uh, when we come to Genesis chapter 15. In the grand scheme of things, God, in the beginning, He spoke creation into existence. And as I like to say, some people will say, do you actually believe He did that in seven days? I said, no. He did it in six days. He rested on the seventh day. That's what God's Word says. 
And everything was created good. And on the last day, God looked at it and he said it was very good. The last day he created on day six, he would create mankind in his image and likeness, male and female, created he them. And he put them in a garden and he gave them the charge to have dominion over all that was. And he gave them one command, and that was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they did, and horror ensued. Because what God said would happen indeed is what would happen. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. die. And some will say, well, Adam and Eve lived many, many, many more years, hundreds of years after that. How could it be true that in the day they ate it that they would surely die? How many know there's more to life than just natural life? There is spiritual life, that which is eternal life. Mankind was fallen as all of creation was then fallen because the crown of creation, mankind, had sinned. All of creation is affected and impacted, some in ways that we perceive and understand and recognize, and some in ways that we can't perceive and recognize fully So there's a new heaven and a new earth. But all, everything you see, all of the things Sister Jane was talking about, we live in such tumultuous times in so many ways, wars and Famines and these such of things that are the uh, what happens in a fallen world because it is uh, again it's sin cursed and it's fallen because man chose to sin. And then here it is: is that as you read through Genesis chapter four, then we have uh, they went from Eden. And I don't know why they always say it's an apple. I don't know if it was an apple. It was a forbidden fruit. My mama, my grandma, she used to have all kinds of sayings, and she would always say, "How do you like them?" Anybody ever heard that? How you like them apples? I don't know why it was always an apple, but it was always an apple. But at any rate, it went from eating the forbidden fruit to then murder ensuing between brothers. Cain kills Abel. Horror indeed. But then there would be hope. Even after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, one of the first things that God did was when he brought the curse to Satan, he said, there's going to come one from the seed of woman that though you bruise his heel, he will crush your head from horror to hope. I'm mean, thankful for Amen. that. We go, Cain kills Abel. It looks like the line is dead, but God raises up one in the place of Abel in order for the Messiah to come through. You go to Genesis chapter 6, and the earth is filled with wickedness and violence. The heart of man is evil and wicked. He only dwells on evil things continually to such a degree that God wipes out the face of the earth with a flood, but Noah and his family were spared because they were in the ark. A symbol, of course, of Christ Jesus. How many are thankful if you're in the ark of Christ yeah. Jesus? From horror to hope, there still would be a Messiah. Then we come to the Tower of Babel. And here it is that man disobeyed God again, and they raise up this tower. Instead of spreading across the face of the earth, God squashes the tower. But then in Genesis chapter 12, hope you see it again with the calling of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. So Genesis chapter 12, Abraham comes on the scene. God says to Abraham, who him and his wife were up in years at that time, already past what normally would be childbearing years. And here it is, is that he comes to them and says, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a seed. And through you, Abraham, and through your seed, singular, Paul will point out in the uh, New Testament books, through your seed, all the world will be blessed. Of course, that's saying about Christ who would come to us from the Abrahamic lineage. Christ who is the Savior of the world. Then we come, Abraham, as God instructed him, he leaves the place where he was at from Ur of the Chaldees. And he goes to the land seeking, as Hebrews will say, a city whose builder and maker is God. How many seek that city whose builder and maker is God? And here it is, is that when it is that he would travel, he would have a nephew, Lot. And then they would, God bless them. And both men, Abraham and Lot, his nephew, were very, very rich. And they had a lot of uh, flocks and what have you. And it got to such a degree that they couldn't dwell in the same land. And Abraham, though he was the one that was older, he was the one who would have the authority to go and say, I'm taking this land, Lot, you go over there. Abraham goes and he says to Lot, you pick out what your lot will be. And Lot picked what looked to be the better land. But how many know the grass isn't always greener on the other side, so to speak? Right? And so he went towards Sodom, which would play itself out in the chapters to come. But God would bless Abraham. And Abraham knew if his lot was with Lot, it'd be a better lot than the lot that Lot picked. That was a lot of lots. All right, but... 
Don't ask me to say it again. I don't know that I said it right the first time. But, but at any rate, Abraham, he's following God. Genesis chapter 14, his nephew Lot gets in trouble. There's some foreign kings that come. And I won't go into all the story, but they had a battle amongst kings. And Sodom, the area by which uh, uh, Lot would live, was taken captive. All their stuff and all of their people were taken. What does Abraham do? Abraham musters together his men. And in the power of God, he goes and defeats these kings that had taken Lot captive. He meets up with Melchizedek, but he gets a great victory. But after that great victory that God gave Abraham over these foreign kings comes this. After these things, Abraham is fearful. And the word of the Lord comes to him. Let's say that word, the word of the Lord coming to someone. That phrase is used a hundred times in the Old Testament. Here's the first time. The word of the Lord comes to Abraham. Abraham, why is he afraid? Obviously, he's afraid because what does God tell him? He says, fear not. Do not fear. That phrase, by the way, fear not, is used 365 times in all of Scripture. Here's the first time. How many are thankful if you're in Christ, you can hear the words, fear not. Abraham is terrified. He is in horror. Why? You say, it doesn't make any sense. He just won a great victory. How could it be that he is horror, that he's afraid? Here's why. Because he knew those kings would want revenge. And they might come after him. He knew that what Abraham, if you look through the life of Abraham, he could be afraid. He would be so afraid that at times he would say his wife was his sister in order to get him out of trouble. Abraham was one that was had these kind of proclivities. And don't judge him too harshly. How many here have ever been afraid, even since your Christian life, from one thing or another? I think of the great prophet Elijah who in the book of Kings will tell us this. He has this great victory on Mount Carmel where the fire comes down and, and consumes his sacrifice. And he and others kill all the false prophets of Baal or of Baal. And then right after that, after that great victory, the very next chapter, he is terrified. He's, he's afraid because Jezebel is going to be on his case and has uh, vowed to kill him. How many know there are things that cause us to fear in this life, even after great victory? And here Abraham, he's had this great victory, and the word of the Lord comes to him. Can I tell you, we have many things of which we could be afraid to be sure. And you know what? The answer to those fears are, it isn't to think somehow you have the ability to conquer. It isn't somehow to say, I can work this out in my own mind. I, doesn't mean that we're lazy. It doesn't mean we don't think. It doesn't mean we don't work. But do understand this. If you're a child of God, aren't you thankful that you need not, as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, you need not fear man who could just kill the body if you fear God who could kill both body and soul in hell. If you know him, you have reason to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It is indeed that we are in Christ do you know a good way to calm your fears is to read the word of God and see what it is that he had said. What does God do? He doesn't come down and necessarily say, I'm going to overwhelm Abraham with peace. He says, I'm going to come with my word to Abraham. God would send his word. Well, how many are thankful that God sends his word to Amen. us? And if you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you that illuminates the Word to you. And that uh, makes that Word come alive, so to speak, because the Word is alive. Quick, that is, it's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. How many are thankful for the Word of God to come Amen. when we are afraid? Amen. The best thing that could come to the horrors that we experience in this life, the terror, is for us to know the Word of God. Amen. And it brings hope. Now, not just hope like the world. You know, when the world talks about hope, and it bears, it's good to take a moment to define this. I use from horror to hope because they start with the same letter. And hope is a biblical word, to be sure. But hope in Scripture is always different than the hope of this world. The hope of this world is, maybe so. I hope so. Could it be? Perhaps. No, hope in Scripture is this. You don't know how. And you don't know when, but it's not a question of if, because God's the one who has spoken it. It's a certainty about what God has said. And here it is. God comes to Abraham in a vision. And the hope he gives him, he says, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. I would tell you, you look throughout the Psalms especially, the kings 
of the nations in the past were looked upon as the shields of the people. David would talk about God, even though David was king in the Psalms, he would write about God being the shield to him. Psalm 3, uh, you probably, you might not know the address, but you've probably heard, you've probably heard it before. Your, uh, thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. How many heard of that before? David wrote that, Psalm 3, in the context of Absalom, his son, rising up against him. And actually him being displaced from the throne for a period of time. The great King David, betrayed by his own son. And yet, King David, who was off of the throne and in a cave at the moment, knew that even in the cave, God is a shield. How we're thankful he is a shield. He's the one who will protect us. And here it is, and some may say, well... That is, are you saying that we never go through trouble in life? Are you saying that there's never any problems? Are you saying that all always works out rosy and that every day is zippity doo da zippity day? I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is this. God is not a man that he would lie. And if you are in him, the worst that man could do to you is to have you absent from the body, which means if you're in Christ, you'd be present with the Lord. And what's so bad about that? How many are thankful this morning? Amen. Amen. So you look here, he says, do not fear. The first horror that Abraham has was a fear of men. We can have a fear of men as well. But we need not fear men if we fear God, for he is our shield and tells us to fear not. Look at the next horror, verse 2, that Abraham experiences. The next terror, the next problem that's addressed is this. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came, there's the second time, to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now I mentioned this briefly in the kind of the introduction to Genesis 15 is this, Abraham or as we usually call him Abraham that's what his name would be so if I go back and forth between Abram and Abraham it's the same fella when I talk about it this morning but Abraham had already been promised of God that though him and his wife were up in years back in Genesis chapter 12 that they would have a son through whom the Messiah would come this is many years later, still there's no child. They're even more past child rearing and bearing years. Especially his, his wife. And I will tell you, when, when you go to the New Testament, it says Abraham is good as dead and his wife really dead. In so far as being able to, to give natural, uh, in the natural sense of the word, to have birth. How many know, I will tell you, every time you see a childless woman in the Old Testament for whatever the reason might be. And Sarah was childless for many, many years and was past the point where in the physiological sense of the term, she should give birth when she gave birth to Isaac some years past Genesis 15. Every time you see that, it's talking about Jesus was going to come from forth. What could be more dead than an old woman's womb would be a virgin womb. It's absolutely dead. Can't have life. But God can make a virgin have a baby. Amen. And how many know that's true? But here it is. Is that what transpires here is this. Uh, the next thing is Abraham says to God, basically, you promised that I would have a child, and I have no child. And so of all the stuff that I have, of all the promises you've made to me, the one to inherit must be my servant, Eliezer, one that's not born of my loins, one that's not born of my body. And what is it that God says to him? No, you are going to have a son. You are going to have one from your own body, which would be Isaac. You are going to have one through whom the Messiah would come. And here it is. God had already, in previous chapters, had already told Abraham to count the sands on the seashore. As many as those would be, would be his descendants. Now God uses a different uh, illustration. He says, look up into the sky. See all the stars? That will be as numerous as your descendants will be the stars in the sky. 
And here it is. God sends his word to Abraham to let him know and strengthen him again that the word of God is true. Numbers 23, 19, I quoted a while ago, is that God is not a man that he should lie. How are we thankful? He's God who is the truth. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the word of God, God incarnated, that is, in flesh. Your Bible is the word of God inscripturated. How many are thankful God tells the truth every yeah. single time? Men may lie, and I've mentioned it before, but the older I get and the world in which we live, where you can have AI and artificial intelligence, all, I don't even know about it except for I know what the letters stand for, but they can make all these things that are lies and make people believe lies, and it's hard to know if someone's telling you the truth or someone's telling you a lie. But can I tell you, when you go to the Word of God, you can know Amen. God's not a man that he should lie. He tells that God be true and every man be a liar. And God says, look up into the sky and see the stars. That's as numerous as your, as your, as your uh, seed is going to be. I think of an old Rich Mullins song. Brother Rick likes Rick, Rich Mullins. I do too. He went on to be with the Lord about 30 years ago now. But his most famous song is probably, Our God is an awesome God he made. How many know that song, right? We sing it in here from time to time. He wrote a lot of other songs too. And one of the songs he wrote was Sometimes the Night. And it's not, it's, it's the chorus you may have heard before, but probably not the verses. But it talks about Abraham in the verse. It says, sometimes the night was beautiful. Sometimes the sky, God told him to look into the sky, see the star. It says, sometimes the sky seems so far away. And then it says, uh, sometimes the, 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 uh, it could be so close you could feel it, but your heart would break. And then it says in the second verse, it says, Sometimes I think of Abraham, how one star he saw had been lit for me. He was a stranger in that land. I am that no less than he. And on this road to righteousness, sometimes a climb can be so steep. I may falter in my steps, but never beyond your reach. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Again, he says, sometimes I think of Abraham, how one star he saw had been lit for me. And you may say, well, I'm not Jewish. I'm not of the Abrahamic lineage according to the flesh. And God certainly does have a plan for his people. It's not that the church replaces the, uh, the, the people of God insofar as, as the Hebrews. But it is this. Paul says plainly in Galatians, if it is that you are in Christ how many are thankful? You're a partaker of the salvation that came through the Messiah that came through Abraham. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? One star he saw had been lit for me. So here it is. God renews the promise to Abraham that he would have a child. And that is what Abraham was wanting more than anything, was to have a child. Perhaps for selfish reasons, so that his line would continue. Perhaps for more evangelistic reasons, because he knew that through him the whole world would be blessed. Perhaps some mixture of the two. But how many know God is faithful to his word? He sent his son just like he said he would. Just through who he said he would. Because again, God is not a man that he should lie. Yeah. I'm here to tell you this morning. There's a lot of preachers. They'll get up and they'll tell you stuff like I mentioned a while ago. They'll say, you come to Jesus and you'll never have another rough day in your life. Oh, you'll be, I mean, and, and I've actually even heard them say this. Not only will you be healthy and wealthy and wine, you'll get the best place, parking space at Walmart. I've actually heard them say that. That's not me just making it up. Say, you know, now, I'm thankful. Sometimes I have gotten the best parking space at Walmart. Of course, you know the best parking space at Walmart is, uh, is if your love, <laughs> if your wife goes during the week and you don't have to go to Walmart. <laughs> All the men said, yeah. All right. But, but that having been said, I would tell you, I've actually heard them say that they make a lot of promises for God that God never made and that they don't have the power to keep. But I'm here to tell you this morning, any promise that God has made to you or to me or to anyone else in his word, he, nobody twisted his arm to make it. You didn't, you didn't say, God, you're going to do this. Right. He doesn't make any promise that he doesn't intend to keep and that he doesn't want to keep and that he doesn't keep. How many are thankful for yeah, that? Yeah. Every promise, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this. All the promises of God. How many? All the promises that God has actually made. They are yes and amen in who? In Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus would come 
through the Abrahamic lineage, just as God said to Abraham that he would. Now, I will tell you, from the horror of, again, thinking that he wouldn't have a child, to God reconfirming that through saying, count the stars in the sky, that's the second hope, or horror to hope. The first was fear of man. God says, I'll be a shield. Fear the promise won't take place. Look at the stars in the sky. Now, verse 6, I won't take a little break from our theme, but I can't read chapter 6 and not dwell on it for a moment. Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Oh, that's a great verse. I said that's a great verse. It's quoted by Paul in Romans and in Galatians. James quotes it too. Some wouldn't think James, James quotes this verse too. Uh, chapter 2, verse 23, if memory serves. That it, it, it's this. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. Paul will make the argument in the New Testament because some would say, nope, salvation comes through the law. And Paul would say, nope, the law came some 400 plus years after the time of Abraham. And Abraham, it was said, he was he, he, he righteous. He had salvation. How could it be through the law if that came 400 and some years later? Some would say, no, 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 it comes through circumcision. Paul would say, well, of course, they didn't have the chapter divisions back then. But Genesis 15 is where it said it was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Genesis chapter 17 is circumcision. Paul will say, how can he be saved by circumcision? And if that's 17 and 15 is where this, it's because of this. It's not by works of the law. It's not by circumcision. It's not by your works. It's not by your natural heredity, so to speak. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Yes. Believe God and it was counted to him. As righteousness, how many are thankful for that? Yes. And look here next. And I will tell you too, I don't think that it's by accident. Of course, nothing in God's word is by accident, right? I don't have all the ins and outs of it figured out yet, and I won't this side of glory. But the longer I study God's word, the more ins and outs of it you know, and how many are thankful for that? But I don't think it's by accident either. It says Abraham believed God and it's counted him as righteousness. And what is the context? Abraham believing he's going to have a son. And through that son is going to come the, 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 the seed that is the Messiah. How many are thankful for that? Amen. It deals with Jesus, the Messiah. Let me get my clicker here. If I don't get my clicker, we'll be stuck on verse 6. All that. that wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> Look at verse 7. The next horror, the next terror. Uh, well, God says that to uh, Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. Abraham says, oh, Lord God, how am I know that I will possess it? So the next horror is this, is that Abraham had been promised land and he hadn't yet possessed it. He says, how is this going to happen? How am I going to possess it? God says, so bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now I want to stop here for just a moment. Here, the third, again, the first was fear of men. God said, I am your shield. The second was fear, hey, this promise of a child and of seed and even of the Messiah, how's that going to come to place? And God says, count the stars in the sky. Third is God says, uh, this land is your... He said, well, how am I going to know that I'm going to possess the land? And that could be, again, another promise. You want. How is it going to... Could cause you anxiety or fear. And what does God do? He says, go out and get these animals. Now, Abraham would have known, as no doubt some in here are well-versed in as well, he would have known that when, you, when God told him to do that, that was the way they... One of the ways that they would cut a covenant uh, uh, relationship. We tend to think of it as a deal, and I... Not that that's totally bad, but it's not a deal apart from relationship, to be sure. Okay, and so that that that's the way that that uh, people that were uh, uh, you know high up people would, would would make kings would make covenant with one another. And so, in a sense, this at first I believe because there's no mention of tear up until the next verse, which we haven't read just yet. That Abraham thinks, how am I going to have this land? Oh, God's saying he's going to. Cut a covenant with me. And, oh, what a joy to be in covenant with God. How many can say amen to that? What a joy to be in covenant with God. Right? You can be in covenant with another individual, and that might be wonderful in whatever that covenant happened to be. But how many know nothing better than being in covenant with God? Amen. That having been said, although there's nothing more joyful 
nothing more wonderful, nothing greater than to be in covenant with God, there's also nothing more terrifying. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, look at the next verse. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, what came upon him? Terror. Terror, horror, fear, and great darkness fell upon him. You say, why would he go from, again, in the way we framed it this morning, from horror, fear, to, to hope, that is to the certainty of knowing that God will be faithful to his promise. How could he go from, you know, vacillate, so to speak, or, or not necessarily that he was vacillating in faith, but that his emotions or whatever might vacillate or however one would want to describe it. How could it be that such things could happen? He's kind of probably good that God's going to kind of come, but then it sinks in. You can kind of come in with another person and try to be as faithful as you can. They might not even know if you've broken that, depending on what the terms were. Because they might not even find out because how many know? People may know a lot, but they don't know everything. Anyone here ever gotten away with something? You're getting, you ain't getting away with it right now. I know everyone in here has gotten away with something, or you think you have. At least not with God, but with man, right? Now, the kids at school, they're always looking, trying to get away with something. And they think teachers don't know. And as I mentioned, sometimes teachers don't know. But we know a lot more than what we tell. I'm going to tell you, I had a student, if you're not familiar with it, at the discipline instrument they have at school now is no longer a paddle. It's this paper called referral. It's kind of hard to spank them with a piece of paper. No, yeah. But it's this paper called referral. And I was teasing with a student on Friday. They were being bad. And I, says, I said, you deserve a referral, but if you can spell it, I won't give it to you. <laughs> I would tell you, I asked six or eight students that throughout the day. You know how many of them could spell it, right? Nah. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. I went home and I asked my son. <laughs> Every parent likes to bag on their kid a little bit. Went home and asked her son, we homeschool him. I say he's got the best teacher in the family. And I, I go home and I said, my boy, can you spell referral for me? And he did spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but at any rate, at any rate, the students think they get away with stuff. And no doubt they do. There's some stuff teachers don't know. But we know more than what we call them out on. Otherwise, I'd never get any math in if I called them out for every, every single thing that I'm aware of. But it could be that you could cut a covenant with somebody and you or they might violate the terms of that and it might not be known because people don't know everything. It could be that someone would violate the terms of a covenant between two men. Someone might violate it and when they go to discharge the penalty for breaking the covenant, that the guy that broke the covenant was more powerful and he could perhaps keep that judgment from coming upon him. It could be that two men were in covenant and when one broke it, the other said, I, I, don't, I, just, I don't care. It's okay. Can I tell you, none of those things are cutting the covenant with God. How I many of God knows everything? Nobody knows, gets by with anything that he doesn't know. Right. Tell you, you look at the book of Revelation, you don't think God knows Revelation chapter 20 says those who are unbelievers, their sins are written down in books. Books, plural, it's going to be a long day in the heavenly courthouse, so to speak. Because it's written down in the books. How many are thankful, though, if you're saved? It's your name that's written down in the book, singular of life. Amen. That's good news, right? Because our sins have been washed whiter than snow. But everyone else, the sins, uh, the things they should have done that they didn't do, things they did do that they shouldn't have done, thoughts that they harbored in their mind and in their hearts, of which perhaps... Others may not have done, but God knows it all in their day. That's right. Can you imagine? You want to talk about a day of horror. For those who know not Christ, I know that would be a day of horror. Amen. And there's no one, you can't claim any legal technicality. You can't say, hey, no, I, I didn't, I didn't mean, I didn't. Know. No, that's the highest court in the land. And God knows he's got all the evidence he needs. All the witnesses. How are you thankful? God is the one he, that he knows. Now I say, you're thankful for that. If you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, that should cause you great terror. Amen. And then what happens here is this. There's great terror that comes upon Abraham because he knows. God knows everything. And yes, if he breaks it, if Abraham were to break whatever this covenant is, God would know it. 
And God cares about his covenant. He cares about his work. He doesn't sweep anything under the rug. How many know God knows? And if God's for you, who can be against you? But if God is against you, who can be for you? That's how we used to say it in the southern uh, Hebrew. If God is against you, who can be for you? All right? I mean, that's true. It's, you will never have enough of an army to defeat God. In fact, some people think God's worried about all the Psalm 2. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations gather together against the Lord and His anointed one? God in heaven, He scoffs at them. What are you thinking? I mean, oh, God is almighty, all powerful. Amen. And here it is, is that what transpires here is Abraham, though I believe that at first he may have said, Oh, God's cut in a covenant. That's the sign that I'm going to have the land, just like the stars in the sky. Here's the sign that's going to be this. But then he starts saying, What does it mean to be in covenant with God? How could I possibly? God would know. How could I? God will surely keep his end. How could I? How could I keep whatever my end happens to be? And I tell you, when they had these here, We'll keep reading verse 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite. Is not yet complete. And I will tell you, God knows all. Why? Because God knew about them going down for 400 years of bondage. God knew that they come back in. God knew when Abraham was going to die. And God's not trying to estimate probabilities. I think this. Uh, God knows what's going to happen. Amen? Amen? Then look here next, verse 17. It came about when the sun had set. that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. And I would tell you what that meant, these animals cut open. When the kings of old, what they would do, they would call it the blood path. They would split these animals down in half and there'd be blood in the middle and they'd walk through this blood and what they were saying is, if I break this covenant with you or you break this covenant with me, then let what happened to these animals happen to the one who breaks the covenant. How many know that would be, uh, that'd be, uh, I, no wonder he was in terror and horror. <laughs> right? He's in terror and horror. This is what's going to happen to me if I break the. You know, this is me. Uh, that means be afraid in, the, right? in Greek and Hebrew and English. Right? No wonder he's afraid. But then what does he do? Abraham is asleep. He sees this in a vision. And what happens is that there's a flaming torch and a smoking oven that passed between these pieces. Did Abraham have to pass between the pieces? Did Abraham pass between the pieces? No. The flaming torch and the smoking oven passed between the pieces. And it goes back to verse 6 of this same chapter. If someone was going to be saved, it wasn't going to be because somehow I kept my end of the deal. It's because when you didn't keep your end of the deal, I, I, I tell you, many, and I think rightly so, if you study this verse, Hebrews talks about the everlasting covenant between the Father and the Son. Everlasting covenant. Notice, smoking oven and a flaming torch. I believe that to be representative of the Father and the Son. And if mankind breaks the covenant, and how many know every man, woman, and child has broken the covenant? Yes. All the sin and falls short of the glory of God. How many know you're part of all? Yes. All the sin and falls short. And God basically said that if you break the covenant, Abraham, this is what's going to happen, not to you. But to me, and how many know, some uh, 2,500 years later, what would happen is the Son, because mankind had broken the covenant of God, broken the rules of God, broken the, the commandments of God, the Son of God would die upon a cross, and indeed it would be like all of that animal blood that was shed in the Old Testament pointed to the blood of the capital L, Lamb of God, which doesn't have to be, indeed can't be, shed over and over again. But it's so powerful, it was shed once and for all, that our sins might be forgiven. How many are thankful for that? And here it is, is that that's what transpired. Now, I will tell you, Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed God, and that's how it is in the New Testament, it's spelled out. We're not saved by our works. We are called to repent of sin and put trust in Christ. 
faith in Christ, the one who bore our penalty, the one who bore our punishment, as Isaiah 53 will say, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. How many are thankful he bore that upon the cross for you and for me? And it's not by our works. Oh, listen, I will tell you, and anybody who's honest with themselves, and I say honest with themselves and true to Scripture, will say, wow, if it depended upon me to be good enough to earn salvation, you're in for a long day at the office. And it ain't never going to happen. You say, well, I've stayed away from more bad than... Then, 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 uh, uh, then, so somebody else. You're not judged by somebody else. You're judged by Jesus Christ, the righteous Amen. one. Amen. You say, "Well, my my good deeds outweigh my bad." First off, I assure you that's not true. But even if it were true, if you've got anything on the scale of bad, boom, you deserve eternal punishment. So it's, that's not fair. That is so not fair. I'll tell you what's more not fair. That you didn't walk through the blood path. The smoking oven and the flaming torch did. What's more not fair than for sinners being judged? Oh, well, that is righteous. God says that's righteous. But if you think of that as unfair, can I tell you what's more unfair? Is that the righteous one would bear the sins of the unrighteous. How many are thankful? God's not fair according to those kind of definitions. And it's to our benefit. Thank you, Lord. And here it is, Abraham. On verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And by the way, that covers more land than what people think. And God will be faithful to do just that. Amen. Look at verse 19. The Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Cabanite, and the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Rephaim, and the Hamarite, the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. God is going to be faithful to do just what he promised from horror to Abraham was in horror that somehow he would walk through that blood path and knowing that he couldn't keep it, but aren't you thankful that the Son bore our penalty upon the cross, Amen. that those who would believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. I'll, I'll close with a more serious illustration that I opened with. I opened with the illustration of from horror to hope, when it is that, that uh, uh, the bell rang and the bus came on the last day. And I'm thankful the bell rang and the bus came, don't get me wrong. But I'll close with a more serious illustration. Some of you may be aware, we have coming up later on this week, June 6th, it'll be the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Right? Where World War II, some of you be familiar, World War II, that uh, America was at the forefront, but there were other allies involved. And back in World War II, close to the conclusion, it would, it would conclude in the subsequent year. But one of the big moments where the Allies went to defeat Germany and its Axis powers was when we launched an invasion on Normandy. Now the Germans and the, the enemy of, of the United States, now, they had the higher advantage of being, uh, uh, they're up on the hills and we're coming in. And there are soldiers, which thousands are buried over there. And uh, thousands of where we, we went one time to see, you know, there's close to Sarasota from the Aka River exit. If you've never been there, you ought to go there. We have one. You can be there inside of an hour and see uh, something similar to an Arlington or similar to where you see all these graves of men that you, men and women that you don't know, but how many are thankful for them uh, being in service to our country. Yeah. And here it is, but they, uh, uh, they have a big cemetery over in France. I've never been there, of course. I've just seen it in pictures. But, but they have it over there where, for the Americans that died and, and, they, and, and others that died in the process of this trying to free Europe from the grip of, of the Nazis and of Hitler. And our soldiers came, and they were basically sitting ducks from these up on high. Sitting ducks. But we came with an overwhelming force. I was listening to a radio person uh, or TV personality in the course of the last week and they took their family over there to see these sites around Memorial Day. And this dad said that he has a couple teenage sons and he showed his sons the beaches and told them about what happened there, showed them the graveyard, what happened there. And then he went up to these places that were in the high places, that were in the, the hills, the cliffs, 
Some would sing that course in Florida, how many know anything's a mountain to us? <laughs> but they would come there to the cliffs. And where the Germans had their, uh, you know, their, their foundation, their, their uh, fortresses, so to speak, there. And he, he showed them where it is that the ceilings, you can still see the ceilings, and he showed pictures of the ceilings of these places they had in the cliffs. And you can tell that it's wood and it is burned. And he said, what happened there is our men came there and they, many of them were killed because they're basically setting ducks for a while. But we came with such, oh, we had more numbers than what they had. And we basically went, our men, our forces went from a place of horror to hope in the sense that they're getting killed and slaughtered out of the air, out of the land, and, 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 and they were seeing those fall by their side as they conquered the beaches of Normandy. But eventually, what happened? The overwhelming numbers that we had and the skill that they had and the commitment that they had overcame the enemy army. So they went from poor people down to hope were in control. And this fella, he said, and I thought about it from the German perspective too. They didn't know things were coming that day. They thought there was an invasion coming somewhere else and I won't go on to the history of it, otherwise uh, I might be long-winded this morning. I, I sure wouldn't want to be accused of being long-winded. <laughs> Jesus, long long-winded. I think it's a spiritual gift. Like the, 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 I'm in 3 Corinthians. <laughs> I'm teasing. There is no 3 Corinthians. You got a Bible that's got 3 Corinthians. You got the wrong Bible. All right. But at any rate, as this man said, I can think of it from the German perspective too, though, when he saw where they were entrenched and then they saw the wood that had been burned with flame, and you can still see it there. The wood that had been burned with the flamethrowers. Because what happened was, when our armies went there, when they would make it up the cliff, one of the things they'd do is take a flamethrower and try to take out the enemy soldiers that were hidden in these places, or, or, or that were entrenched in these places. And he said, think about it from the German perspective. And now, he didn't, of course, he had no idea that I was going to preach this message, but there's a good illustration. The Allies went from horror to hope, a certainty, we've taken over. The Germans, the Nazis, the Axis armors, they went from what we're in this place to horror. Mm -hmm. For they were defeated. And in, uh, some of them experienced the literal fire of the flamethrower. Horrors are terrible. War is a terrible thing. <clears throat> People die on both sides of it. It's certainly a terrible thing. I'm thankful that the Germans didn't win that under Hitler, aren't you? I'm thankful for that. But can I tell you, for those who are the people of God, if you think about your life before you were in Christ, you have reason to be terrified. You're lost and undone without God and His Son. You have no hope, no salvation at all can be found in you. And you read throughout Scripture, I could go time and time and time again. But Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, he preaches many verses. And what does it say? They are in, what shall we do? How many are thankful there's an answer to that? Amen. What shall we do? Repent and put trust in Christ. Amen. And you can go from the horror, not only of this world and of this fallen world, but more importantly, from the horror of having to stand accountable for all the sins that you have committed and that you have harbored and for which you will be judged righteously by a righteous God, and you can go to the hope that is the certainty of knowing that you're a child of God. Amen. Well, I will tell you on the flip side of it, if you're not a child of God, any hope that you have is in this world alone. It's not because of me preaching this morning, but I will tell you this, wherever the word of God would come, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Wherever the word of God would come, to those who know not Christ, can I tell you? That's hope being extended right there. But if one receives it not, you won't go from horror to hope. You'll go from hope to horror. And a place where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. And you may say, Ben, how could you say such a terrible thing? It's a true thing. Jesus himself said it. Amen. But I tell you, if it is that you're in that condition this morning or you know what? Pray for this a very real and present danger. It's pointed that a man wants to die and then the judgment. Those who know not Christ, you go from whatever little hope you could get in this world to ultimate horror. But to be in Christ is to go from horror 
to not a wishful thinking hope, but to knowing that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. He's paid for your sins. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. And he's coming back to receive us unto yeah. himself. Yeah. How many are thankful for that yeah. this morning? Let's stand our feet this morning. Lord, we come to you today. If there would be any here this morning that know not Christ, I pray their hearts will be convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and that they would indeed know the horror and the terror that they would, uh, that would befall them if it were they were to stand before a holy God without the advocate of Christ Jesus, who is the only advocate. Lord, if there is anyone that knows not Christ, I pray they be convicted of what their situation is, terrible situation indeed. Lord, I pray they will be convinced that Christ and Christ alone is the Savior, the one promised back in the book of Genesis that though so many ways was tried to be thwarted from coming, and yet just as God promised, He would come at the right time, God would send forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, and not have a spirit of fear and of bondage, but one whereby in Christ we could cry out, Abba, Father. If there's any here this morning that know not Christ, I pray they be convicted of sin and convinced that is put faith and trust in Christ as the only Savior. They would come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are in you, for those who are in Christ, whether it be of many years or whether it be of recent times, I pray my brothers and sisters would rejoice in God our Savior this morning, knowing that we have been brought out of horror and into this hope, this is, that this is the eternal hope, the only hope, the for sure hope that is the salvation that's found in Christ, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light, name written in the Lamb's book of life. Not perishing, but having everlasting life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I pray that we would rejoice in that truth and give you praise and give you glory. Lord, before we leave this morning, we lift up prayer requests to you. Lord, we thank you. What a wonderful testimony that our brother Mark and his, and his wife Betsy, Lord, in New Mexico, that their, their house was spared. We thank you for that that they've got an upcoming showing of it. We pray for your hand in there, that you bring just the right person in just the right way, Lord, and just direct our brothers and sisters' steps as they get moved out toward this direction, Lord, toward this way. We pray your hand be upon them. Lord, we lift up the jail ministry this afternoon and pray your hand will be upon Brother Todd and others as they share the message of genuine freedom that's found in Christ alone. Lord, we pray for the upcoming events, not only this week, but I know of next weekend, we pray that your hand would be extended to evangelistic events and that people would hear your word, be convicted of sin, and drawn into the Savior. Lord, we lift up to you this morning, uh, Brenda, and pray for your hand to be upon her physically and for your hand to be upon her as well as provision. Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, for your healing hand on Miss Betty, Lord, with her knee. We pray our brother Valera and sister Regina have a good remainder of their trip, Lord, in Europe, and that as they come back home, they'd have a good and safe return, and pray for your blessing to be upon Sasha, with whom they're visiting out there as well. Lord, we pray for your hand to be upon Cal, Lord, and his family, as they have stood for the cause of pro-life, and Lord, are now encountering such difficulty and, and uh, persecution. We pray your hand to be upon them. Lord, we pray for your touch this morning. To be upon as well, um, Lord Norma, Lord that Nadia and and uh, uh, Sister Joe have had such opportunity with, and we pray that you would just continue to open her eyes to your word, and that she would follow you and be in the house of God. Lord, we lift up to you, Kenneth Hutto, and we pray your healing hand to be extended to him. Lord, your touch upon him, Lord, in his body and in his mind. Pray for my dad's appointments that are upcoming. Pray that they will go well, dear God, and that you bless him in them and that there be good reports. Lord, we pray for every need that's represented here this morning for uh, Sister Kay, who's not feeling well today. We pray your healing touch upon our precious sister. Lord, we pray for Steve and Steve, these two Steves that have been 
on our prayer list and we pray, Lord, you touch them physically and most importantly, draw them unto salvation. Lord, we pray that your hand would be with Alyssa, dear God, and the, the, this little one, Lord, that, that uh, her, and her and her husband Nate are going to have. We pray that, that you bless the pregnancy and the delivery of the baby and as well as your healing hand upon Alyssa. Lord, we lift up every need this morning that's represented here, both spoken and unspoken. Pray you move by your grace and for your glory, and may we not fail to give you the praise for it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the power of the Spirit we come, and all of God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of His power extended to all who believe. Amen and Amen. God bless you today in Jesus' name.